When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Chapter 11 of Hebrews. Oh, this is faith central. Faith headquarters. Paul is going to fix our gaze on some of the greatest examples of faith that he can think of. Remember what he said earlier, I'm trying to well, provoke each other to love and to good works. Well, here he's trying to provoke us to faith, and he's doing it by providing some of the greatest examples he knows. In some ways, well, I'll put it this way. Paul took us on a tour of the tabernacle. Now he's going to take us on another tour, but it's a tour of the faith hall of fame. That's what I call Hebrews 11. The Book of Mormon has its own equivalent. Moroni takes us on a tour of the Book of Mormon Hall of Fame in Ether chapter 12, another magnificent chapter. But the original is here in Hebrews 11 as Paul is walking us through the pages of Scripture, his Scripture, the Hebrews Scripture, so that they can look back and think, oh yeah, all of these mighty men and women of the past, they had faith too. And what did they have faith in? Paul makes it crystal clear. They had faith in Jesus. To which we would think, what, what, what are you talking about? No, they, this was Old Testament. Jesus hadn't come. Oh, you're right. But they knew he would. They never cast away their confidence. They had a full assurance of what was to come. And they lived their lives by it. You ready for the tour? Come on in. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Let's stand at the front door first and see what's etched in stone over the entrance. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now the JST changes substance to assurance, and many modern translations do the same. The Greek word literally means a standing under, like being under a guaranteed agreement, a title, a deed, something promised to you, you something you can bank on. That's what faith is. So faith is this assurance of things hoped for. You were, you were only hoping, but you had enough confidence. You had enough assurance that this is exactly where I'm, I'm choosing to stand. Not only is it the assurance of things hoped for, it's also the evidence of things not seen. Wait a minute, if you can't see it, what, what are you talking about evidence? Well, there's things in the future I can't yet see, but there's things from my past I have absolute evidence of. Elder Bednar actually has done the best job I've ever seen on this of helping us picture the past, present, future components of our faith. And he builds this on this verse, Hebrews 11 verse 1. The first phrase, the assurance of things hoped for, is the future. It's this sense of I, I'm hoping for that. It hasn't come yet, though. But that's all right by me. I have the assurance it will come. And through that assurance, I can be patient and wait for the fulfillment. That's my future. Now, what about my past? That's the second line. It's the evidence of things not seen. Well, wait, the not seen is the future, right? Well, at some point in your past, there were if there were future things you hadn't yet seen. But guess what? They came through. God came through for you. And as a result, you had evidence of those things that back then you had not yet seen. Now you see them. Your faith has been confirmed. So let's take this and look back at times where I didn't have any sight, but I exercised faith and God came through for me. And thus I now have evidence from my past. Hmm. And with that evidence... Of course, it's providing continued assurance of things I yet hope for. In fact, it provides me so much assurance, I can act on that assurance in my present. For that, Elder Bednar went to the lectures on faith, where Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon are teaching the elders of Israel, preparing them for their missions. And I mean, lectures on faith, in some ways, is the, re the restoration's equivalent of Hebrews chapter 11 
where they are taught this is what faith consists of. And among other things, the lectures tell us that faith is the principle of power in every intelligent being. It's what moves us forward into action. Ah, that's the present tense. So as Elder Bednar taught, from the past, I have evidence of things I hadn't seen until God showed me. And I received no evidence until after the trial of my faith, right? So here's my faith, and then the evidence came. God came through. Based on that evidence from the past, I can now implement action in the present as I move forward with hope in the future. I have the assurance of that. And what's amazing about it, Elder Bednar said, is it's a, a spiral upward that just keeps reinforcing itself, building upon itself, gathering speed. Because as I move forward in the present toward what I'm hoping for in the future, with that assurance that faith provides, then as I exercise that faith, faith precedes the miracle, but the miracle comes. And now that I have that kind of evidence, ah, let me put that back in my past to propel me onto the next round of the spiral. You understand what Elder Bednar's teaching here? He taught it way better than I ever could. But it really is an amazing growing up in God kind of process, living by faith. Now, in case that's still too nebulous, too theoretical, let's give you some concrete examples of this from the pages of the Old Testament. Come on into the building. Welcome to the Faith Hall of Fame. I'm going to start taking you down hallways and into rooms and little alcoves where there'll be a, a bust of some Old Testament figure. A painting of a patriarch or matriarch. Let's, let's get some paraphernalia. I mean, if you go to a sports hall of fame, there's their cleats, or there's the ball, or there's the bat, or here's the guitar if it's the rock and roll hall of fame. Well, in the faith hall of fame, what could we bring in as evidence of things that that person had not seen, but eventually came through because of their faith in God? Ready for the tour? Verse 2 and 3, for by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. And we're not going to get specific about that yet, but this good report, the elders, are our forefathers, they exercised faith and, and God counted it for righteousness. Ah, good report. Well done, thou good and faithful servants. Or how about a bigger one? Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Well, how's that one? What can faith accomplish? Anything, everything. From qualifying us for commendation, there's the good report, to creating worlds without number, that the Lord could create spiritually, create with the eye of faith, envision what the universe would look like, and then put it all into practice. That's amazing. The world around us, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, they also declare the faith of God, knowing that he could bring those things into reality. In verse 4, let's make it a little more personal now. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Amazing that Abel, though dead, can keep on teaching us. He can speak from the grave, and what would he speak about? Faith. Faith in the promised Lamb of God that would someday be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Abel had learned that from his own parents. This is all taught beautifully in the book of Moses, where Adam and Eve, having left the Garden of Eden and being given the law of sacrifice to keep, when they don't understand why, and yet they obey despite that, the angel comes and explains, this is in similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God. So everything you do, do with an eye forward to Jesus. In other words, do with an eye of faith. And then Moses says that Adam and Eve taught these things to their sons and daughters, which means they taught it to Abel, he knows it. He understands it. He's teaching it still from the grave. And it means that Cain knew it too. So then why would Cain offer sacrifice from the fruits of the field? Now, I have, I've had students over the years wonder, what was wrong with that? I mean, Abel was a shepherd, so he has sheep to offer. Cain was a farmer, so he has fruits of the field to give. 
He was giving what he had. What's wrong with that? Well, attitude is everything. <laughs> That's part of it. But also, what's the symbolism of the fruit of the field? Yes, eventually, the law of Moses will include the first fruits, that you will sacrifice not only the first lings of the flocks, but the first fruits of the field. Okay, it's kind of a tithe of your increase. But that, that wasn't the case in Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel's day. The only sacrifice they'd been taught about was that of an animal. And it was meant to be a parallel, a heavenly, excuse me, an earthly shadow of a heavenly form. And so sacrifice the first ones of your flocks. That's exactly what Abel did. It was a more excellent sacrifice. It was proof that he had faith in the promise of God that a Savior would come. And exercising faith in that promise, seeing it afar off, knowing it would eventually occur, he offered his sacrifice accordingly. Picture Cain, on the other hand, saying, fine, mom and dad, you want me to give something to God? Okay, whatever. What has he given to us? Nothing but a boot out of the Garden of Eden. The way you guys describe it, everything was perfect there. And yet dad... And you, you and dad uh, eat the forbidden fruit, and then dad gets this curse about having to bring forth from the ground, because of the, from the sweat of his brow, bringing forth bread the rest of his life. Well, guess who's sweating, bringing forth bread from the fields? I am far more than able. There's a, I, I, I sense a certain frustration on Cain's part, as if the curse were passed down more particularly to him than to his brother. So you want me to give something to this God that's never given us anything to me? Fine. I'll take whatever fruit I have and offer it to him. But don't give me some story about some future lamb of God that's going to come and sacrifice his, his life for the sins of the world. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. And it was that lack of faith that made his offering unacceptable. There was an interesting verse in the book of Romans that says, whatever is not done in faith is sin. And Joseph Smith picked up on that verse and picked up on the story of Cain and put them together in the lectures on faith and said, that's the main reason why Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. There was no faith in it. There was no symbolism pointing forward to the atonement of Jesus Christ. And therefore his sacrifice exhibited no faith in that future sacrifice. You with me? No wonder it was rejected. And so, Abel, thank you for showing us the better way. Thank you for giving a more excellent sacrifice. Thank you for speaking to me, although you are dead. In verse 5 and 6, next scene in the Faith Hall of Fame. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. And then a more general statement based on that. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There is so much in that passage. Again, we have seen... Oh, the good reports as you enter the Hall of Fame. The good reports of those elders. They had faith in, well done, high marks. We passed that and we saw some, no, oh, moon rocks, some dust from creation and saw that God created the heavens and the earth through his faith. There we see oh, a painting, perhaps, of Abel and his initial sacrifices offered in faith in the promise of Jesus. From there we go to the next, and there we see Enoch. Are there any foundation stones there from the city that he built that was caught up to heaven? Well, talk about an amazing example. To believe that somehow they could overcome the wickedness of the world all around them. Somehow they could establish a Zion community where there's one heart and one mind and no poor among them, everyone dwelling in righteousness, that's a tall order. And yet Enoch saw it in faith and then got to work. It, that's what pleased God. But what I love about the expansion of that statement is what Paul said in verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Again, whatever is not of faith is of sin. 
Why would we do things without expressing to the Lord that we trust Him in the process? Actually, in the lectures on faith, Joseph and Sidney teach a powerful, powerful truths about the three requirements of faith. For us to have faith unto life and salvation, saving faith in Jesus Christ, three things are required. Number one, we have to know that God is, that He exists. We have someone in whom to place our trust. But secondly, and as a kind of an, an outgrowth of that, we have to know what God is like. We have to have a correct understanding of his attributes and perfections and character. Because if he's not the type of being that we can exercise faith in, then there goes our faith as well. Is he all-knowing? Is he all-powerful? Is he all-loving? Is he honest? Is he no respecter of persons? Joseph said that missing any of those constituent parts and God would not be a God worth believing in. He has to be all of those things, but he is. And then the third thing, and this is probably an outgrowth of the first two as well. I believe in God. I know what he's like. And third, I know that I'm living in such a way that I can call upon the powers of heaven. That's not flawlessness. That's not perfection, but it's faith manifest in works. I'm doing what God would ask of me, which shows that I do have faith in him. I'm, I want to be part of this covenant relationship. Now, with that in mind, reread verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That's the first part. Okay, I know, I believe in the existence of God. Second, that he is a rewarder. I know that about him. He, he keeps his promises. He keeps his word. He gives gifts as he has promised us. And then third, he's the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Am I living in a way that I'm worthy of that divine help? It's all right there. In fact, if you were to read the lectures on faith and the book of Hebrews, one after the other, it's amazing how many ways they intertwine. In fact... Attribute after attribute that Joseph and Sidney mention in describing God, you'll find somewhere in the pages of Hebrews also. It's, it's an amazing exercise. But keep reading, and in verse 7, our next scene in the Hall of Fame. In here it's Noah. There's a little piece of gopher wood there, a little pot full of pitch that he used. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, they're coming. You will see them. You just don't see them yet. The storm clouds haven't begun to gather. The rain hasn't started to fall. But you believe. Remember the definition of faith, the assurance of things not seen. Well, he hadn't seen it, but he knew it would come. Therefore, he moved with fear. And the Greek there can also mean reverence. And with that reverent fear of God, he prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now, in Noah's case, he never intended to condemn the world. He was trying to save it. The 120 years he spent building the ship, he also spent crying repentance. They just wouldn't listen. At least not without seeing the rain start to fall. But by then it was too late. We have to act when things are not yet seen. We receive no witness until after the trial of our faith. And merely to act when things are obvious, there was no risk there, and therefore no reward. But will we trust God before it becomes obvious? Faith precedes the miracle. So don't wait for the miracle. Begin exercising faith. The next scene, and this, this, you get a whole wing in the Faith Hall of Fame dedicated for, to this couple. Verse 8, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Think about that. I guess I'm leaving. God told me there was something better out there, but more happiness, more peace, more rest. I guess I'll just go. Now, he doesn't know where he's going. He hasn't seen the land yet that God is promising him, but he obeyed. He acted before it was obvious. Next verse. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And how could he handle that strange country? 
this stranger in a strange land, this foreigner in a new land of promise, because he knew this promised land was only temporary. There was a far greater land of promise he had his eyes on. That's what Paul says next. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You see, it hadn't been built yet, but the foundation is there. And if you go to a work site and see where the foundation is laid, you can probably start to envision what kind of building, or in this case, what kind of city, is intended to be built on top. Just enough evidence for our faith to have a leg to stand on. What has God promised? Where has he given me his word? And I'm happy to head off into the unknown, step into the darkness, because I know the light of the world will shine. He'll help me see eventually. So let's move forward. I picture that kind of faith when Brigham Young launched off into the unknown wilderness and just decided, yep, we're going to find Zion in the Rocky Mountain somewhere. He'd already seen that faith in Joseph Smith. Well, we're going to build Zion in Missouri. Don't know how. Never been there myself, but let's go and start. Let's turn a swamp into beautiful Nauvoo, shall we? Let's see it with the eye of faith and then make it happen in reality. Picture Brigham Young sending settlers down to southern Utah. And you want to talk about a God-forsaken place that they were going to invite God into. Well, God invited them there first. And with the eye of faith... Maybe we really can make the desert blossom as the rose. They began working toward it. That kind of faith is in our DNA as Latter-day Saints. It's in our DNA as members of the house of Israel and seed of Abraham. That's how it all began. You make the promised land out of practically nothing because you believe God's, God's promises. Verse 11 Abraham was not alone. Wherever you see him, you've got to keep an eye out for Sarah. And sure enough, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. And I love the description there. It's not just that she believed it could happen, but she believed that she would have the strength to do it. I can't imagine what it would be like, well, at any age to give birth, knowing the labor and pain and travail that would be required of you. But to have the strength in your old age, where's that going to come from? I, I certainly don't have it. It's okay, Sarah. You don't need to have it. I have it, and I will give it to you. She had faith she'd be able to do that. And here's why. One of my favorite lines in the whole chapter. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. She was shocked by the what, but reassured by the who. If anybody else had told me this, oh, there's no way. But because the promise came from God, then I believe him. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Therefore, Paul says, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. There's the Abrahamic covenant. And God's keeping his part because Abraham and Sarah believed he could. The description there is pretty rough. You look at Abraham, you, you picture Sarah, and she's feeling old. Will I have the strength to conceive and bring forth a child? But she looks over at her husband and is like, yikes, he's as good as dead. And he was getting close. So imagine that where death is what's staring you in the face. And yet somehow you're supposed to hold on to the promise of life? They did. I'm not going to focus on my weakness. I will focus on God's strength. Forget my death. It's his life that will make the difference. And I'm exercising faith in that life. Now, one of the most powerful things about all of this, this fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, is something Paul had already mentioned in the book of Romans. There's some amazing hints about faith in the book of Romans as well. And this one blows me away once you connect it to Hebrews chapter 11. This is Romans 4, 19 through 21. Hopefully it's a good reminder of what we studied a few months ago. Be not weak in faith. We're still talking Abraham here. Be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead. You see the same idea? Him as good as dead. Man, my body is, I'm closer to the grave 
than I am to anything else. When he was about a hundred years old, so you can't blame him, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So, hey, honey, don't look at me. I'm not the only one on death's doorstep. Uh, my body is dead. Your womb is dead. It's never brought forth life. So we established that. But, Paul says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. And, and, and what a staggering reality he'd have to wrap his head around. Like, whoa, me as a father in my ancient age? Sarah as a mother? Oh, okay. I'm, 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 hold me steady. I'm trying not to stagger. Instead, what was he? He was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. That's exactly what Sarah is feeling when she judged him faithful who had promised. It's always the who over the what or over the how. We get so caught up in those things. How on earth is this going to happen? I don't know. You don't need to. Just trust the who. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For God, all things are possible. I trust him faithful who has promised. So who cares about my dead body or your dead womb? Okay, honey, let's go have a child. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a moment, but look at verse 13. These all died in faith. Remember, he talked about Abraham and Sarah, but also talked about Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. They all died in faith, not having received the promises. Wait, what? They didn't receive them? Well, they received, oh, the initial down payment. They received the earnest of the inheritance or the surety of the better covenant. They, I mean, Abraham and Sarah at least had Isaac and Ishmael. That's a start. Not exactly sands or stars in number, but we can get there and good enough for them. With Isaac and with Jacob and the house of Israel coming together in this new land of promise, all the promises had not yet been fulfilled, but that was okay. They hadn't received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Sound a little like Noah. I hadn't seen things yet, but I know they're just over the horizon. These ones saw it starting to poke up off in the distance. They saw them afar off. And not just see, they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. It's not just Abraham that had to go to this strange country. Earth life itself is a bit odd. If you've ever felt what I call celestial homesickness, and, or as Eliza R. Snow said in her beautiful hymn, I am a stranger here. If you've sensed that in mortality, a certain divine discontent, knowing there's something better for you, more happiness, peace, and rest, well, embrace it. Be persuaded of it. Come unto it. Confess the fact that, yeah, the earth really isn't my thing. So if I feel or act a little out of place, oh, forgive me, it's there's something better. There's some far distant land of promise that I'm headed toward. I need to travel light. I'm not going to get bogged down with worldly cares or, or worldly concerns. I'm headed to heaven. As a result, they can die in faith as was said there. I didn't have to have all the answers or all the blessings right now. There was no expiration date on my patriarchal blessing. And so if those promises don't come in this life, I know that if I continue faithful, they'll come in the next and good enough for me. Whether it was the land of Ur or the land of Haran or the land of Canaan, Abraham just wanted to follow God wherever he took him. So again, if this life, if we're strangers here anyway, in some ways, I don't want all those blessings to come here. I want them to come where they'll last eternally, where moth and rust doth not corrupt. Hold out hope for that. And even if you die, die in faith. The promises are still alive and well, waiting for you. Verse 14, For they that say such things 
say things like, oh, I'm like what I just said, say that I can die and I'll still have faith, say that I don't have to receive the promise yet, I can see it afar off and I'm fully convinced of it, fully persuaded. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, something better, somewhere over the rainbow, as we might sing. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. In other words, if they were so fixated on, oh, but I'm leaving this behind, and oh, can't I take this with me, and, and why isn't God coming through for me right here, right now? Well, you might as well have stayed there then. Because chances are, like Lot's wife, you're going to turn around and start heading back, and that's the problem. Yeah, you might have returned, but, but you didn't. You move forward with faith. So here's your description. But now they desire a better country. That is an heavenly Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. <laughs> so, so beautiful. We've seen so many betters and graders and hires throughout the book of Hebrews. And here it's a better country. So I'm not even looking in my rearview mirror. It's, it's the kingdom of God or bust for me. And so better country, yeah, a heavenly one. And God won't be ashamed to be seen with us because we're not ashamed to be seen with him. Even though the promises haven't been fulfilled, fulfilled yet, I trust this. I trust him. I know he'll come through. Then verse 17, how I may have ushered you out of the Abraham and Sarah wing slightly prematurely. Can we go back in? There were a few other things in the display case that I wanted to show you. So here they are, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now Paul is dramatizing this for good reason. This is a central scene in the story of faith. Abraham and Isaac, it doesn't get much better than that. But notice how he's described. Isaac is called Abraham's only begotten son, which technically wasn't true. He had Ishmael as well. But by using that language, ah, are we hearkening forward to Jesus Christ, the better sacrifice, the better Isaac? In God's case, the hand was not stayed, and he did have to sacrifice his only begotten son in the flesh. Abraham, on the other hand, didn't have to, but the fact he was called to and didn't expect God to stop things last second, but there's an irony here, a horrible irony, and Paul is drawing it out the way he describes it. Let's walk this thing through. So, Abraham, you're going to have seed like the, stand, the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven. Okay, got it. Um, how, when does that start? And decades pass. It starts to look like there's, not, there's no way he's going to have a child through Sarah. And so he has a child through Hagar, and that's where Ishmael comes in. He's like, okay, now you can bless, from here on out, you can bless the world through Ishmael, and eventually I'll end up with that innumerable posterity. And God says, nope. Nice try. Appreciate Sarah's sacrifice. And, and I have a plan for Ishmael and Hagar as well. But no, the child of promise will come through the wife of promise. It's not just the patriarchs that matter. It's the matriarchs. So it's Sarah's son, not just Abraham's. And here, and here comes Isaac. Okay, so Isaac, I now know, as far as the covenant is concerned, Isaac really is the only begotten. He's the only one through whom the covenant will come or will be passed. Then why on earth are you asking me to sacrifice him? Uh, Heavenly Father, I hate to put it bluntly, but you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're making it impossible for you to keep your own promise. Are we going to shift back to Ishmael now? Because Isaac's not an option if I, if I sacrifice him. And I just picture God just looking at him testing, trying Abraham's faith. Do you not trust me? I know which son is which. I know through whom the, the covenant will come, but I'm asking you to trust me when I'm commanding you to sacrifice your son. Now, this is the, the next phrase is what truly blows me away. And for this one, we need to bring back in what we saw earlier in Hebrews 11 and what we saw back in Romans chapter 4. Because notice the next line. Here's Abraham ready to move forward. He binds his son. He lays him on this altar of sorts and lifts the knife in trembling hand 
And it wasn't a matter of like, okay, and one, looking around, hoping for an angel, and two, looking around a little more nervously, uh, two and a half, two and three quarters. No, it was none of that. Abraham fully intended to go through with it, despite the fact that he knew crystal clear that the covenant somehow would still come through Isaac, even though Isaac would be killed before having any posterity of his own. Here's why. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. That blows my mind. Because that tells us what Abraham was expecting. Not the hand to be stayed but the lifeless body to be raised. Do you see that? Okay, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. Actually, maybe I do. When Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad, how much of Jesus' day did he see? Did he see the whole thing? Did he see sacrifice and resurrection? Is that what he's picturing? Oh, Father, this is a gut check. But if this is a pre-enactment of what Jesus will someday do, are, we, are you asking for crucifixion and promising resurrection? Are you asking that I slay my son and then that I raise him from that altar? If so, then I believe This is astonishing to me. Abraham believed that he could raise the dead to life again. That I'm going to go through with it. I am going to slay my son. But then I will command him to return from the grave. And will come home to Sarah, having passed this excruciating test. And eventually Isaac will have children of his own. And from there, the promises of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob can be fulfilled. That's mind-blowing. But again, Paul left, left us the most incredible little hint at what gave Abraham that kind of faith. Did you, did you see the last phrase? He was going to raise him from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And remember, figures are those foreshadowings. Well, what figure had he ever had of, of raising Isaac from the, from the dead? Ah, you remember Abraham was on death's doorstep himself. His body was essentially dead. And what about Sarah? Sarah's womb was Isaac's tomb. He wasn't supposed to come forth alive from that tomb. It was a place of death, not of life. And yet life emerged from it miraculously. Roll the stone away, and he that was dead liveth. You understand the powerful parallels, the incredible symbolism? It was, and this goes back to Elder Bednar's spiral. You already had evidence of something you didn't see. You didn't see Isaac coming. He's here. And with that, will you now move forward in faith with an eye to some future hope that you have assurance of? Will you do this? I hope that what I've proved in days that are past will help get you through the days that lie ahead. They did for Abraham in miraculous ways. From there, let's take it down another generation. Verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. You get a sense of looking forward to the future in display after display after display. Let's go to the next generation. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning upon the top of his staff. And the next generation, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Do you see the common thread with all three of these generations? Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. They all lived in such a way that they were looking beyond what we might call the claustrophobic present. Here I am in this world. Oh, there's a world to come. There will be things that outlive me. So, though I lay a dying, oh, there are blessings yet to come. And let me bless my grandsons. In Joseph's own case, as he lay dying, you're not going to stay here in Egypt forever. This was merely to survive the famine, but good days will lie ahead back in the land of promise. When you go back, please bring me with you. 
though it'll just be my bones <laughs> that you bring back home. There is a better country. I'm a stranger and a foreigner here in Egypt. We all are. Plan on better days ahead. Have the faith to embrace them. Or verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child or a goodly child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment, which is pretty impressive since the king's commandment was to kill anyone that crossed him. Oh, we're heading into another large room in the Faith Hall of Fame. And this one's dedicated to Moses. But who you meet on the way in are his parents. There's Amran and Yocheved. And to see their incredible faith and courage, those two often go together, trusting God. There's something about this child. There's something about this ah, future deliverer. Well, for him to ever deliver us, we're going to first have to deliver him. So let's hide him. Now, anyone ever tried to keep a child hidden, a newborn? Imagine if their cries, if heard by others, would spell your own death as well as that of the child, of the infant. Have you ever seen that movie, The Quiet Place? My kids always laugh that every week our home turns into The Quiet Place. In the movie, if you make a sound, then you get gobbled up by these aliens. In our house, if you make a sound, it's going to get picked up by the microphone that dad's recording on. And so they're tiptoeing around the house every week while I film. <laughs> Bless them for that. But can you imagine if it really was death staring them in the face if they made a sound? I often have to retake things because I heard the microwave beep or they were clattering pots or something or they came down the stairs too loud or they slammed the door or the dog barks. There's all kinds of sound and believe me, the microphone picks it all up. Well, imagine the all-hearing ears of Pharaoh's army, his soldiers, his troops that are out there, busybodies trying to oh, win the, uh, the affection of Pharaoh, get on his good side. I don't know. There's, but the, the thought of keeping a newborn silent, I'm amazed they could do it for three months. After which they realized, we're doing the best we can, but... Are we trusting too much in ourselves? If this boy, if this baby is the deliverer, then God will deliver him. We've had faith that God could help us. Maybe, yeah, have faith that God will help this little boy. And so they commend him to an ark of bulrushes and the hand of God. And the rest is history. It's Israelite history. It's Hebrew history. My audience, Paul is thinking, are you getting this? Faith is in our blood. So look back to Moses and see his incredible parents, what they did. But it's not just parents. Now go further into the room and let's see Moses himself. Do we get to see the rod there or his robe or just something to remind us of this great lawgiver? And notice what is said on the plaque beneath, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, so now it's his turn to exercise faith, the same kind of faith his parents had. And by that faith, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Nope, I'm not the prince of Egypt anymore. I want to follow the prince of peace. And the way Paul describes it here is magnificent. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's, a, that's how long the pleasures last. Just a season. And that season is fall, by the way. It, the leaves are falling. It's coming to a harsh winter any moment. So I'd rather put my eggs in the next life's basket. I'd rather suffer now in order to find rest later. I'd rather stick with the people of God than the pleasures of sin. I trust the recompense of reward. I'll go through this great fight of affliction. There's better days ahead. Or the next phrase, esteeming the reproach of Christ better riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Think about how faith affects our choices. What we pursue, what we refuse, what basket we're going to put our eggs in? <laughs> what kinds of rewards do you think Pharaoh could give a prince? That's incredible. 
And yet for Moses, no. Why trade an ocean full of glory for a thimble full of pleasure? No. Egypt will come and go. It's come and went. But the glories of God, I'll hold out for them. The riches of eternity are God's to give. So I'll come unto him. But did you catch one word in that verse that would have shocked any expert on Moses' history? He said that the reproach of Christ was better riches than the riches of Egypt. That that's how Moses took it anyway. I'm, I'm fine with the reproach of Christ. And talk about you know, christening the Old Testament. Talk about an anachronism. That's what they're going to cry foul about. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's no Jesus in the Old Testament. There's no, Moses didn't know Christ. And Paul says, oh, are you sure about that? Moses was a Christian. Oh, that's amazing. So yes, my fellow Hebrews, we all can be. Moses was ahead of the curve. But will you esteem the riches, or the reproach of Christ, I should say, greater than the riches of Egypt? Or in our case, the riches of Rome? Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Embrace it wholeheartedly. Suffer whatever affliction or persecution you must face. Being reproached for Jesus' sake puts you in celestial company. With that then, verse 27. We're still in Moses' room. By faith he forsook Egypt. I don't need this place. Not fearing the wrath of the king. What's there to be scared of about him anyway? For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. How did he get through all that? He didn't have his eye on Pharaoh. He had his eye on God. And that was enough for him. He could get through anything. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Can you imagine how scary that would be? Okay, tonight, all the firstborn are going to die unless we do this strange ritual that involves hyssop plant and the blood of the lamb. Well, they believed and they were blessed accordingly. Then the next step, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assaying to do or trying to do were drowned. Well, their action wasn't mixed with faith, but Moses's was. Moses's action was to move forward with an army on one side and the, and the ocean on the other. Soldiers, sand, and surf. Which do I choose? Pick your poison. No, exercise your faith. And as the Lord says in section 8 of the Doctrine and Covenants, I speak to the mind and heart. That's what I did for Moses. It was that spirit of revelation that got him across the Red Sea. Really? Just got you speaking to the mind and the heart? Some thought popped into his head like, huh, I should part the waters. Huh? That sounds insane. But no, the heart is reassuring me. Hmm. God had promised me earlier I would have power over the waters. I thought that was fulfilled when I changed the Nile to blood, but... Maybe there's something bigger. Yeah, the Spirit seems to be confirming this, giving me courage and faith to move forward, even into the waters of the Red Sea. Okay, brethren, sisters, don't hold back. M launch forward. Start marching, even if we have to wade into the waves. There's something profound about this courage. There's something powerful about this faith. Now, with that, we move on from that room back into a hallway. And we're quickly walking through other passages of the Old Testament and seeing display and painting and various paraphernalia left and right. This next one, verse 30, has some of the stones from the city of Jericho. Maybe a ram's horn, the trumpet that was blown. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Can you picture the Israelites going, uh, Joshua, you sure about this battle plan? He's like, uh, yeah, I'm sure who it comes from. Have faith, this will work. Or the next one, this next display, you see a little scarlet thread that had been hung out of a wall in Jericho. 
Sure enough, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. It's as if she were asking, is this the real God? Are these people really God's chosen kingdom? I believe so. I'm exercising faith, and she was thereby saved alongside the faithful. Ah, what shall I say more? We're kind of running out of time. We've got to fly through the rest of the, the Hall of Fame because it's almost closing time. So what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. I mean, this is how Paul is reading the Old Testament. It's a compilation of stories of people who exercised faith in God. And that is a story that's unending. We need to build whole new wings on this Hall of Fame, because this is only the Old Testament section. I remember once going to the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, and I was with a, one of my brothers and his wife, whose father was an archaeologist, and so she was so drawn to the e Egyptian section. And she poured, my brother and my, my sister-in-law, poured over every plaque. I spent hours there. And I'd been to the net before, and I'm like, there's so much here. And we're losing time. But they were so enamored by Egypt that I said, okay, um, we got like 10 more minutes before quitting time, and there's a lot of other history I want to see. Do you mind if I leave you and just sprint through the centuries, and then I'll meet you at the exit in 10 minutes? They're like, oh, go for it. And that's exactly what I did. I literally sprinted through the, much of the rest of the Met and just took in that and took in that like, oh, Persia, Babylon, uh, all these amazing things. And then out of breath, okay, quit in time. I got to go. But there's so much more. There's no end. There's Smithsonian upon Smithsonian. And so to this Old Testament Hall of Fame, yes, bring in the Book of Mormon Hall of Fame in Ether 12. Could we construct our own from the pages of the New Testament. How about from church history? Actually, how about from personal history? This would be an amazing exercise of remembering. What, what would I put down under glass? What kind of display cases could I create to show the evidence of faith in my own life? that I have exercised that faith because I believe him who promised me. And whatever those things might be, because honestly, we talked about this, what, three years ago, I guess, in the Book of Mormon? When we studied Ether 12, by the end of it, Moroni, our tour guide, thinks he's done. And he's like, oh, these amazing people throughout Book of Mormon history, including everybody that was banking on this record eventually coming forth. Huh, no wonder God has commanded me to, oh, no. And it's like Moroni has this identity crisis, like, I'm supposed to do some, whoa, okay, their faith without my works is dead. Their faith is riding on me doing something to fulfill their hopes for the future. Yikes, the future is now. It's go time. I always wondered about this last little alcove near the exit of the Hall of Fame, and it seemed so well built, but it was totally bare. And I was like, well, I've already been through the whole Book of Mormon. There's nobody else left but me. Oh, the, huh, to me. That's my spot? I don't deserve to be here with everyone else. And yet that's exactly what God intends for all of us. The last spot on the tour of the Hall of Fame is is our place. And what evidence of things not seen can we produce? My friends, there's something powerful, something personal about all of this. I can't tell you every, everything. I can't introduce you to everyone. But Samson, even Samson, had some issues, but a man of faith in other areas. Jephthah, David, Barak. For this, you got to go back to last year's study, but to study scripture looking for faith, that's, that's an amazing way to approach the text. From there, he's going to be more general, and almost as we're rushing out of the Hall of Fame, he's shouting out uh, to us from behind, here's some of the things they did. Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms. 
wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Can you see Daniel there? Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. That's the foreigners. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Think about how many people Elijah and Elisha healed and raised on behalf of their devastated mothers. Others, meanwhile, weren't delivered in the same way. But they were delivered in a different way. They weren't delivered from their trials. They were delivered in them. And their eye of faith got them through those afflictions. Here's Paul's description. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection, or the JST, the first resurrection, which is the best resurrection we could have. Think of faith being the answer to every problem, the source of strength to get through any trial, either to escape those trials or to endure them well. No, I'm not going to give up on God just because things are hard. I'll accept the reproach of Christ, because he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This will all come out okay on the other side. And then verse 36, speaking again of those who suffer, others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, I mean sawn in half. There is Jewish tradition that that's how Isaiah met his maker. That being persecuted under the reign of, during the reign of Manasseh, he was put into a hollow tree and then the tree was cut in half with the living Isaiah within. Again, that's tradition. But was it him or it others? As far as Paul is concerned, some people met that kind of grisly fate. Others were tempted were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And then he interrupts himself. Of whom the world was not worthy. Do you sense how much Paul admires these incredible Old Testament saints? The world wasn't worthy of them. I don't know if I am, but I want to be. And so if I have to face those things, the very jaws of hell gaping wide open the mouth after me, I will not back down. I will not lose faith. I will be worthy of heaven, even if the world is never worthy of me. Those kinds of people, Paul says, wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. But they never felt trapped by those mortal circumstances. Because off over the horizon, they saw a better country awaiting them. They were persuaded, convinced of that. They embraced those things. They were okay waiting. And with patience, they never cast away their confidence. This is such a profound chapter. As it comes to its close, look at verse 39. And these all... And so many others he could have listed if he'd had more time. Having obtained a good report through faith. We're coming full circle. Remember the, how it all, the tour began? Those elders received a good report? Well, all of these people did. They all received a good report because of their faith. They received not the promise, at least not in this life. But God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, that's an odd ending, and that's where the chapter kind of leaves us on this cliffhanger. But the JST helps a little. It says, God having provided some better things for them through their sufferings, for without sufferings they could not be made perfect. And that does seem to make a little bit more sense in context. He's just been talking about all the horrific things people endured because of their faith. The world wasn't worthy of them, but... They were worthy of incredible blessings. And because they suffered those things well, it perfected them. It polished them. And God will bring forth those gems for the sanctified. But can we go back to 
the King James Version. Because even Joseph did. Joseph read this by inspiration and in the early 1830s changed it to focus more on suffering. That without suffering, they can't be perfected. But then near the end of his life, once he learned about work for the dead, he realized, oh, maybe there was something to the King James Version of things. And while the inspired version is probably closer to what Paul actually said, I'm kind of grateful for the uh, potential mistranslation on the part of the King James translators. Can I, can I go back to that? Can I borrow that language? Because in section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where he's talking about the redemption of the dead, and he quotes Old Testament scripture like Malachi, he also quotes New Testament scripture like Hebrews chapter 11. And he says that they the dead, without us, cannot be made perfect. Neither can we, the living, without them, the dead, be made perfect either. Now, this is kind of, kind of cool because for years, I always scratched my head at half of that. The part about they can't make it without us made perfect sense. Because we're talking work for the dead, so of course, they didn't receive all their saving ordinances, so I can perform those ordinances vicariously for them. So they needed me. I'm happy to provide some help. But the other half? I can't be made perfect without them? I, I've got all my ordinances on my own, thank you very much. So my ancestors couldn't provide any of that for me. They didn't need to. So do I really need them? Well, Joseph Smith says yes. And he says it, I would say, in two different ways. Number one, as President Nelson has said, exaltation is a family affair. We're all in this thing together. I mean, Zion is a collective, right? We're not trying to separate ourselves from others like other people have that manner. Remember, we saw that in chapter 10. No, we need to come together as a gathering of the faithful, a household of faith. So that's part of it. But also, I wonder, the way that Paul is saying it here, do you really think you're going to make it without the kinds of incredible examples from those who came before this is why Isaiah said, look to the rock from whence you are hewn and the hole from which you are digged. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah, your mother. See whose blood is flowing through your veins. Paul is saying something similar to his Hebrew audience. You're not going to make it without them, without their examples, their examples of faith. And if we can read scripture and look back and see, in some ways, our spiritual superiors. But looking down across the ages at us, saying, you got this too. Live by the same kind of faith. It's part of the inheritance we have bequeathed to you. Hold on to it and move forward with faith. Oh, thank you, Grandma and Grandpa. Thank you, pioneer ancestors. Thank you, forefathers and foremothers, without whose without whose examples of strength I couldn't possibly be who God expects of me. It's with that in mind that chapter 12 naturally flows out of chapter 11. Oh, cursed chapter headings. <laughs> Quit stopping my train of thought. Because right on the heels of chapter 11, as we emerge from the Faith Hall of Fame out into the world that I have to live in, he says in chapter 12, verse 1, wherefore, so as a result, consequently, based on everything you just saw and felt on the tour, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And I love that image. That's, that's what we brought out of the Hall of Fame with us. It's this cloud of witnesses that we were just encompassed about by. Can I take them with me? Can I bring into my mortal journey the examples and strength and courage and faith of everyone who went before? That's my cloud of witnesses. When I was a paper boy on early mornings in Southern California, not, not cold enough to frost or freeze, but cool enough to have fog come in from the ocean, and I would be doing my paper route, and I would throw a, a, paper, a newspaper toward the driveway or porch of the house. And on those thick, foggy mornings, it was exhilarating to just throw it into the mist and then it would disappear. 
eventually I'd hear it hit the ground, hopefully not the, a window or a windshield of a car, but I would hear it hit the ground, but I couldn't see it anymore. It had been swallowed up by a cloud. That's what fog is, a low-lying cloud. Well, what about my cloud of witnesses? This is one of my favorite visual images of the people of Scripture. They are my cloud of witnesses. And I can pedal my bike through life and just be surrounded by these amazing scriptural figures. My heroes and heroines. And it's not paper newspapers I'm throwing, but I can toss out my weaknesses and my concerns and my lack of faith and have that swallowed up by this cloud of witnesses until, until I no longer see it. I only see the rising sun, the light of Christ that's beginning to poke over the horizon. I've told my students before that when you have questions, gather your cloud of witnesses. I picture in my mind the pulpit at sacrament meeting. And there I am in front, and everyone in the congregation is someone I've met from Scripture. I've got an Old Testament section and a New Testament section. Book of Mormon's front and center because I spend so much time with them. Doctrine and Covenants on the side. We've got some Pearl Great Price people that are coming in from the foyer. Come on in. There's room. And one of the reasons I want to spend so much time in Scripture, one of the reasons I want to know every story and ponder every word, is because that is what gives voice to the cloud of witnesses. If I don't know what they've said, then they can't say anything to me. They're still dead on the page. Whereas if, whereas if I've come to know them and come to understand them, then theirs can be a voice from the dust that I'm aching to hear. So, cloud of witnesses, please come. I'm trying to raise teenagers can I get a little help with that? And Lehi and, S and Sariah are like, Ooh, let me tell you a few things. I'm going through something hard. And Job raises his weary hand. I've got something to do that I don't feel big enough for. And Esther starts nodding her head in the background. No matter what I find myself dealing with or going through, feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what you must do. And I get those all things from my cloud of witnesses. Sometimes it takes a little while. Sometimes they're a little slow. Things are lost in translation. Sometimes I'll ask about how do I help my LGBTQ students understand there's a place for them in the kingdom of God. And I ask my cloud and they're kind of, what, what do those letters stand for? I don't understand. But with enough time, Isaiah raises his hand and shares with me chapter 56. Or parents of children who are leaving the church and they are struggling. Adult children making decisions their parents would never want them to. And what do we do? How do I raise adult children? And I ask my cloud of witnesses and they stand there like, ah, I think. And then they start to quote scripture. Now, that's the hard part. I wish that they could speak my modern tongue. I wish they could say exactly what I need to hear in the way that's easy for me to hear it. But they've passed on. They are confined to the words that they've already written. So often it's then that I pray for the Holy Ghost to act as interpreter. Uh, Peter's saying something, but I don't exactly understand how that relates to my day. And the Spirit's like, let me help you. Okay, Or Nephi always chimes in and says, uh, We did liken all scriptures to us that it might be for our profit and learning. Yeah, that's how you do it. Liken. And then I'm left to do that likening. How does it apply? And so as I'm thinking of raising adult children or people that are making decisions I wish they wouldn't, and Samuel starts to raise his hand and teaches me that magnificent principle in 1 Samuel 8 about honoring an agency, and yet speaking up from my view, and helping them see the future, and not taking it personally, and so many, so many amazing principles. That's scripture study to me. That's what we've been doing for the last nearly four years. We have been assembling our cloud of witnesses. I hope our time to give together has given them voice, so that when you raise your concerns and voice your questions, all kinds of hands start to fly up. The Holy Ghost assists in all the translation, and you see, wow, 
the scriptures really do help me navigate anything. I have a testimony of that from personal experience. I am so grateful for my cloud of witnesses. The next line, though, also helps us see what we're going to throw into the, to the fog and hope it disappears. Start over again. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Those things that are hanging heavy upon us. Just lay it aside. You don't need that. Toss it into the cloud. And what else? How about the sin which doth so easily beset us? Oh, I'd love to get rid of that. That weighs more heavily than anything else I know. And the Lord is asking us to drop those burdens at his feet and bear a song away. With that lightened burden, that empty pack, what can we now do? Next phrase. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The first two verses of Hebrews chapter 12 are some of my favorite words in all of Scripture. Thankfully, the Holy Ghost brings me back to them frequently. To lay aside those weights, those heavy burdens, I don't have to carry them. Jesus carries them for me. To lay aside the sin, yes, it easily besets me. But to repent of those sins, to come unto Christ, to come boldly to the throne of grace, seeking mercy when I succumb to the sin, or grace to make, it, to make me more able to overcome it. Understand, there's so much power here. How about running with patience? That almost seems like an oxymoron. Well, unless you've seen me run. Then I, I do run with patience. It sure requires patience on everyone else's part to wait around till I cross the finish line. Okay? It was actually interesting because over the summer, this is the second time they've done it to me. My, my wife's brothers are all great athletes and they love to run. I mean, who does that? Uh, well, I guess I do since I love them. They invited me to join them on the Hood to Coast Relay Race in Oregon, where you start at Mount Hood and then run 200 miles until you get to the Oregon coast. There's 12 of you. You take turns, three rounds each. It's brutal, unless you're one of my brothers-in-law, and they, like, they love it. And they're like, Jared, come and do this with us. And I did it two years ago, and then I made the mistake of doing it again <laughs> this summer. I told one of my brothers-in-law, you better know that this is evidence of how much I love you. I don't love running, but I love you runners, so count me in. But they gave me the leg of the race that was one of the hardest. I mean, overall, it was practically the easiest one because they, they know me. But the first of the three legs was brutal. Second wasn't bad. Third was pretty easy. And so overall, they, they were kind to me. But what was interesting when I started reading about that first leg, it's you're at, the, you're at, at Mount Hood and it is five and a half miles straight down the mountain. And... It's brutal on the knees, and you just started. You still have to do two more legs after that. Well, I was, I was reading about this, and what made it so difficult was the thought, was the, a couple of additional realities. Number one, you are fresh. You're not sore at all. And so you tend to launch yourself off too fast from the beginning. Plus, you're starting the race, and so you're in this crowd of other people, and the competition kicks in. You got some adrenaline, and so you're, you, and because it's downhill, you can really stride out. But by doing so, you're going to keep building more and more speed until you wipe out, unless you slow yourself down. And so, one of the hardest parts about that leg is you, you're putting on the brakes even as you're trying to move forward, and that thrashes the knees and thrashes the the quads, and it's it's just a brutal race, a uh, brutal leg. But as I was looking at that, going. I think I'm immune to all of those potential problems. Adrenaline's going to push you forward? I don't think I'll be feeling any of that. Oh, the competition to beat everyone around you. Yeah, no, I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, you're going to be striding. I'm like, no, I, I think I'll just be making my way down the mountain just fine. To me, it was, I know how to beat this leg. Run with patience. Realize the race is not against each other, as Elder Holland has said. It's against sin. 
just keep putting one foot in front of the other. It's all about getting to the finish line, even if it takes some friends to drag you across it. That's okay. Th to me, there's this, this powerful truth about... I mean, Paul talks about running elsewhere, right? And he's serious about it. I run to obtain, he says. Or I have finished the course, he says. But here, be patient. There's no ultimatum of exactly when you have to have it done. Just run. And don't feel like you have to run faster than you have strength. Keep that in mind as well. And in fact, the best way to keep running forward is not to stare down at your feet, to look at your <laughs> GPS and see how much longer you still have to go. No, just look to Jesus. He's running right alongside you. In fact, he might be... <laughs> picking you up and carrying you along. But to look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher. Remember we talked about this phrase in the first half? He started the process. He's there for the duration. He'll save you to the uttermost. He's ever living to make intercession for you. I love that he's the finisher of our faith. And if there's still a little more polishing to be done, to bring out the shine, to make you so reflective that you really can show the image of Christ in your countenance. Again, be patient for that too. And speaking of someone who is willing to finish, no matter how hard the finish line was, it's Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For joy, that's amazing. What lay on the other side of the finish line for him? Unspeakable joy. It actually makes me think of Alma's words when he described his own repentance and forgiveness because he juxtaposed intense, excruciating pain with joy that was equally intense in the opposite direction. When I read that in Alma 36 years ago, I realized that might be the best description of what Jesus felt that I've ever seen. You just have to let Alma give you the hint of what Jesus might have been feeling. But listen to him. And think of Jesus saying this post-crucifixion. Once he receives the joy set before him on the other side. His joy of relief. His parents, his heavenly parents' joy uh, that he accomplished his mission. Our joy that now we can come boldly to the throne of grace and follow him into the Holy of Holies. Joy everywhere, in every dimension. And listen to Jesus say Alma's words. And oh, what joy. And what marvelous light I did behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy, as exceeding as was my pain. Yea, I say unto you, my son or my daughter, that there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Yea, and again I say unto you, my sons and my daughters, that on the other hand there can be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. There was something joyful about finishing the 200 miles there on the Oregon coast. Something joyful of having gone through something together with a cloud of fellow runners. I think I ran with more patience than they did, but they <laughs> expressed more patience toward me. Can you sense the joy that is set before you if you just run the race? Walk the race whenever you need to but keep moving forward with your eye fixed on Jesus. He's the one that will get you across the finish line. In fact, he is the finish line. It's that veil that he wants us to part. He then says in verse three and four, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And contradiction could also mean contention or rebellion. I mean, consider that. Think about what Jesus was up against. Yes, joy on the other side, but talk about contradiction on the way. Sinners opposing him, the very people for whom he was dying. Think about that. Consider that, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I mean, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, after all, have you? Striving against sin. Ooh, that puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Yes, the Son of Man hath descended below them all. Are you greater than he? Have you tried harder than he? 
Have you endured it as well as he did? Striving against sin, there's a fight. There's fighting the good fight. Resisting unto blood, what does he even mean by that? How do I resist temptation unto blood? Well, maybe it's a matter of pondering more the blood that was spilled because I didn't resist temptation. Maybe if I faced my temptations with an eye toward Gethsemane and what Christ did to author and finish my faith, maybe there'd be a little less finishing for him to do. Do you understand? that There's, to me, this sense of what the Lord is inviting us to do, what Paul is inviting us into, what the phrase where he said, don't be weary, don't be faint in your minds. Can you hear the phrase that Jacob uses in the Book of Mormon about firmness of mind? We've got to hold fast. We've got to be grounded, rooted, established, settled, right? Don't be moved. Don't be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Don't fall to the cunning of craftiness and the slight of men. Hold to the faith. Remain unshaken. Don't faint by the way. Just keep running by looking to Jesus. He'll get you there. That's the faith that all of our ancestors showed. That's what's going to get you into the Faith Hall of Fame. In verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. And then he quotes Proverbs chapter 3, another place in Scripture that every Hebrew hearer would have known like the back of their hand. Here's this verse. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, well, then are ye bastards and not sons. Strong language there, but that's the word that, that we're given. In some ways, what is Paul doing here? We're getting closer and closer to the end of the book, the end of the sermon. And he's re realizing, he's done so much theology, uh, so much Israelite history, so much explaining of what the ritual really represents and uncovering what the symbolism was preparing them for. Are you, I'm turning you around. Quit looking at the wall in the back of the cave. Let's go out and see the light. Then again, when we go out there, hmm, there's still some darkness we're going to have to face. You going to make it? Let's pump ourselves up with our tour of the Hall of Fame. There's a spot here for you. You can do this. Let's go out and run the race that's set before us. Do it patiently, but do it with faith in Christ. And do it with courage because of what you're up against. There will be opposition. Think of what Jesus faced. It's never going to be as bad for you as it was for him. And when it does get bad, please know that God is treating you like a son or daughter. Someone he believes in. It's not just about good short-term consequences, and I really hope they like me, so I'm going to make it easy on them. No, this is, I've got the long view in mind. And sometimes the harder the practice, the easier the game, and God wants us to succeed at the game. So I, I, that's what I used to tell my sons when they'd get yelled at by their coaches. I said, that's a good sign. It shows that the coach believes in your potential and recognizes that you're not living up to it. I would be more concerned if he messed up and he didn't say anything, because then it's a matter of, well, I'm not really going to put much pressure on them anyway. I'm not going to count on them in the game. You understand? So realize that you're a child of God, and that can include some hard parenting. He expects the best for us. Then verse 9, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. And we can all probably nod to that one. And we gave them reverence. It's like, thank you for letting me know what I was doing wrong. And now it finally makes sense. If you're not there yet, we'll grow up a little bit more. Once you have children of your own, then you look back at your parents. And you're like, wow, you guys were geniuses. Okay? We give them reverence. And if we do that for mere mortal parents, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's always been his goal. So with that in mind, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, 
Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In other words, of course it stinks in the present, but think of what it will bring in the future. If we could be grateful for the tough love of a coach or a teacher or an earthly parent, please endure well the chastenings of a heavenly parent. They're trying to help us grow up in them and bring us home so we can be more like them. This reminds me of my father-in-law's attitude in adversity. He's Job 2.0, as I've mentioned before. And yet, of all the divine attributes, the one he expresses most heartfelt gratitude for, ironically, is divine restraint. So grateful that God treats him like a son that he believes in and lets him suffer and endure in order to grow. It's amazing. Paul then says in verse 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. This seems to be coming out of the left field, just like we saw back in chapter 10. Because I'm connecting with God, and I've got my eye fixed on Him, and He's the author and finisher of my faith. And then all of a sudden you're asking me to look around? For hands that are hanging and knees that are feeble? Well, yeah, you're not the only runner in the race. And there's others that might even need some more patience than you do. I actually passed a few people like that coming down Mount Hood. Like, man, if I passed you, I really feel bad for you. You need any help? You doing okay? Now here, are we lifting up each other's hands? Are we strengthening each other's knees? Are we straightening the paths as best we can. That's what true pioneers do. Make it easier on those that follow. That's what all of those in the Faith Hall of Fame were trying to do for us. Well, can we pay it forward to the next generation as well? Or how about verse 15? Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. I guess the Old Testament includes some counterexamples as well. There's a, 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 a hall of shame, I guess, next to the hall of fame. And though Esau turned things around by the end of his life, and we saw that last year too, amazing stories. But when he sold his birthright for a mess of pottage, oh yeah, what a mess it was. And it was too late to go back on that one. It's interesting what lesson he's trying to teach us though. Something about, I mean, yes, fornication and profanity and those kinds of acts of wickedness. But he also seems to be coupling sins of omission right alongside those greater sins of commission, about not letting anyone else around you fail of the grace of God, trying to help draw out the root of bitterness from other people. Again, we are in this together if we ever hope to establish Zion. Will you help me? Can I help you? In verse 18, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or th thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. What's Paul saying there? Well, he's describing Mount Sinai, where the original law was given. And yet the thunders and lightnings and the quaking of the earth and, whoa, that's what it's like to be in the presence of God? Oh, fearful to fall into his hands. Moses, why don't you go up by yourself? No, thanks. But here in context, no, we all need to go together. So how do we overcome this kind of fear? Well, with faith. Don't hold back now. Don't let anything keep you from climbing the mountain. Don't worry about the fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and trumpet and voice. It's the voice of God that's inviting you to move forward, coming boldly to the throne of grace. In verse 22, 
But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and best of all, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now, we'll come back to that last line because it's a bit confusing, but everything leading up to it, this is the mountain we're being beckoned to ascend. Climb to Zion. Climb to the new Jerusalem. In fact, help build it so there's a place for other people to climb to. This is what we're being asked to accomplish. Assemble with the church of the firstborn, an innumerable company of angels that still has room for you and me. In doing so, we are coming unto Christ, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Everything Paul's been teaching us all these chapters in Hebrews. But then that last line, oh, it's a new covenant. It's a better covenant. It far surpasses anything that was said of Abel. And there you're like, wait, wait, huh? What, what, what do you mention that? I remember we went, are we back in the Hall of Fame? You talked about Abel and a better sacrifice on his part. It had faith, unlike Cain's. Is that why you're... Well, yes and no. This one's really odd. For this, we need the help of the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 17. And the first time I drew this connection, it kind of blew me away. I had been reading Genesis. I got to 17 where... The Abrahamic covenant is being, oh, they're, they're given a token of that covenant in the form of circumcision. And Abraham, this is going to be a, a visible sign that you are part of my chosen people, okay? And in the midst of all of that, there's this fascinating JST that reads this way. God is describing to Abraham where everything's kind of fallen off the rails, an apostasy all around him. He says, they have turned from the commandment and taken unto themselves the washing of children and the blood of sprinkling. And that's not the kind of baptism that I taught Adam and Eve about post Garden of Eden. Okay, so that's, they're falling away from the ordinances. But then this next line, and they have said that the blood of the righteous Abel was shed for sins and have not known wherein they are accountable before me. Now, I was pondering that, thinking, huh, why would, why would they think that? And the more I studied it, it eventually brought me to this verse in Hebrews, that for some reason, you'd have to have somebody speak better things than that of Abel. And it's like, what, what were they speaking of Abel? Well, eventually, evidently, in Abraham's day, they were talking about Abel's blood as if it were atoning blood. That something that Abel had gone through, his blood was shed for sins. And God's like, no, it wasn't. Well, it was shed by sin, namely Cain's, but it wasn't shed for sin. No. I mean, Abel is a good foreshadowing, a good pre-enactment of what he did with his, flo his flock. He was a good shepherd, and there'll be a greater shepherd yet to come. But no, he wasn't an example. He wasn't. He, he was definitely not pre-enacting the atonement by being killed by his brother. That's not it. In fact, it's there that I really started pondering: if people are thinking that's this, Abel is the symbol of the atonement, then where does that put Jesus in relation to Satan? Is this Lucifer rising up and slaying Christ? No. The way it works is a loving father with broken heart allowing his son to be sacrificed on behalf of everyone else that deserved that kind of punishment. With that in mind, it struck me, is there another purpose behind Abraham and Isaac? We already saw back in the Hall of Fame that Abraham fully intended to kill his son and then fully believed he would raise him from the dead. If that isn't pointing to the only begotten Son of God, I don't know what is. But was that God's intent? I don't know for sure, because the scriptures aren't clear enough, but I do wonder if, among other things, not just to test Abraham's faith, 
but to borrow his faith in teaching the rest of the people what the plan of salvation really looks like. It's not just, can you prove yourself, Abraham? But rather, can you help me teach a lesson? This is me as a teacher, like I've got an object lesson, or I need a visual aid, I need a volunteer, could somebody come? And you know, usually have students like, oh yeah, pick me, pick me. Now for this visual aid, can you picture God saying to Abraham, People don't understand what the atonement's all about. They don't understand wherein they are accountable unto me. Somehow they've mis misunderstood Abel's death, and they are putting some kind of salvific value into his blood, and that's not where it lies. It's in the blood of my son, and my son is not going to die because Lucifer rises up and kills him. It's because I, as a loving father, am willing to sacrifice him. Abraham, will you help me teach that lesson to my children? Will you personify that level of paternal love and sacrifice? Will you take your only begotten and offer him up as an innocent offering so people will know what I'm someday going to do with my only begotten son? And Abraham moves forward with faith, astonishingly. I, I, I sometimes laugh thinking, people who are skeptical about the Joseph Smith translation and its value, there's times where I want to go, okay, read Hebrews 12 and this cryptic statement about better things than of Abel. And what on earth is that talking about? Do you really think Joseph Smith was reading Hebrews 12, saw that and said, ooh, here's an opportunity to show my genius. Now, if I can sneak back to Genesis 17 and plug in a little clarification, hmm, someday somebody's going to see this connection. Please. This came by inspiration. And I'm grateful the Lord gave me some hints to help me see it as well. With that, move on to verse 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. That's good counsel. The Lord's speaking to you. He's reaching out to you. Don't stiff arm him. Don't plug your ears. Don't refuse him. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, and he's going to paraphrase Haggai chapter 2, verse 6, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. I mean, Paul loves his Old Testament, right? His listeners do too. So he brings in this cryptic passage, this not very well-known verse about shaking. I mean, there was shaking on Mount Sinai. Don't let it scare you away. Don't refuse him that speaketh. If, we, if our ancestors turned away from Moses and it cost them something, imagine what's going to happen if we turn away from Jesus Christ. So watch out for the shaking. And in terms of that shaking, Paul takes it to the next step and says in verse 27, and I love this verse, and this word, yet once more, that came from the Haggai phrase, once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now you better believe that any verse that talks about shaking is going to catch my attention there's a reason I call this channel Unshaken, and why I hope we can all become unshaken and unshakable saints. There are passages throughout Scripture that talk about this shaking. The one from Haggai just mentioned, well, shaking of heaven and earth. That's some serious movement. Or Jacob and Sherem, where Sherem wants to shake Jacob from the faith, but he remains unable to be shaken. I cannot be shaken, he says. This is another one of these wonderful shaking passages. If we live in a day where there are spiritual earthquakes in diverse places, to the point that even earth and heaven itself seem to be moving all around us, is there anything stable beneath our feet? Well, there's a necessary reason behind some of this quaking. Redemptive turbulence, Elder Maxwell once said. But Part of the reason, according to verse 27, is so you can tell what's been built well and what hasn't. There's that great psalm that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And one of the great things about shaking is you can tell, well, who built this thing? 
Is this one going to stand the test, the, the earthquake test? Do you ever have to do that in like high school physics class where you were creating a, a bridge out of like balsa wood? And then you'd have to take it to the wood shop and they put it on the, on the wood press and put a, uh, a scale underneath it. The bummer of this is eventually the bridge had to be crushed to see just how much its carrying capacity was. And without seeing when it breaks, you can't tell how strong it is. Well, in this instance, shaking allows us to tell things that remain from those that, that fall apart. And so the removing of those things that are shaken, because that was obviously man-made, as opposed to the things that remain, oh, they couldn't be shaken. That must have been firmly established upon the rock. That was a wise man built on the rock, not a foolish man building on the sand. You with me? The experience I once had as a freshman in college, there had been a major earthquake in Northridge, California. And Valencia, where I grew up, is just 10 minutes to the north. And a friend of mine who lived off campus, I was in the dorms, a friend off campus had TV and called me one morning and said, run down to the laundry room or anywhere there's a TV in your dorm and turn on the news. And a roommate of mine, who was also from our, my hometown, we rushed down, turned on the news, and the Northridge, the Northridge earthquake had just destroyed everything. I kept wondering, why isn't it showing our valley? It's just 10 minutes north. And the reason why is because a freeway overpass had collapsed that connected the Santa Clarita Valley to the San Fernando Valley. And, and the news teams couldn't get there except by helicopter. It was that intense. Well, months and months later, when summer vacation came, I left Utah, BYU, and came down home. And they were still recovering from the earthquake. And what fascinated me most was driving through my own neighborhood, which I knew like the back of my hand because of all those early morning newspaper route days of throwing papers into the fog. But driving around then, you'd see a house that looked totally normal next to a house that was no longer standing, next to a house that looked fairly normal but had a police tape around it. Do not cross. This house is condemned. And it was that way over and over and over throughout my whole neighborhood. Before the earthquake, every house looked equally well built. It was only the shaking that revealed the real construction. In some ways, it is only the difficulty we are facing in these latter days that will show us our weak spots. Places that need some renovation. Think about the Salt Lake Temple and all the work that is going into fortifying its foundation. And if you feel shaken by something you read or something you hear or some, something that happens, realize if you're still standing, okay, whew, I'm glad I didn't completely collapse, but there are some weak spots and I'm so grateful to have been alerted about them so I can, so I can work on those things. Okay, if we can understand this kind of concept, then the shaking around us can be helpful instead of harmful. And we can rebuild whenever necessary. From there, verse 28, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, no shaking there, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And maybe that's another one of those nods like, oh, okay, God forbid, don't overcorrect. He still means business. Then again, fire doesn't just have to be consuming. It can also be cleansing and purifying. In which case, oh, light the fire so that we can be cleaner than we've ever been. Well, it's that concept of cleanliness, especially in community, that Paul is going to give us in his final words of this sermon, chapter 13. Here, the rubber hits the road. I've given you the theology. I've tried to inform your faith as well as confirm it. How are you going to live from here? Once the sermon ends and I'm off to some other house church, how are you going to treat each other? 
Well, look at verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Will you please do that? Will you look diligently so that nobody fails of God's grace? Will you lift up the hands that hang down? Will you treat each other like saints with brotherly love? Honestly, provoke each other to that, please. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. That's fascinating, too. Oh, can you be a good Samaritan, not knowing who might be that afflicted Jew at your feet? This is a poor wayfaring man of grief. Talk about an angel unaware, someone that far outranks the angels. Can we treat strangers like that? Or how about this? Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. That's one of the best verses on empathy I've ever read. Because it's one thing to remember those that are in bonds. It's like, oh yeah, I, I should probably help out there or visit or, I don't know, send something. Can I, can I donate, some, make a donation somewhere? My mother-in-law works at a prison to help inmates overcome their challenges. It's an amazing labor of love on her part to a portion of the population that often go forgotten, overlooked, or negatively judged. Now, I'll say this, though. It's one thing to remember those that are in bonds. And my mother-in-law does an amazing thing, job of trying to help the rest of us remember them. But to remember them as if we were bound with them, that's what my mother-in-law does. She goes to the prison. She's in there with them, trying to help. That's condescension. That's atonement in a powerful way. That's Christ coming down not only to be with us, but to be like us. So he's not ashamed to call us brethren. That's empathy. And the other one, don't just remember those that suffer adversity from safe distance. Like, ah, it, it must be really hard for you. What can I do to help? But to treat them as if you were within their own body, and I am feeling what you feel. That's how present I am with you. And to mourn with those that mourn, to suffer with those who suffer, this is the fellowship of suffering, right? And to be in the same body together. Your pain is mine. I share it. And there's something about that shared grief that lifts everyone. How about verse 4? Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Uh, thank you, Paul, after all that you've said elsewhere with more difficult passages, that you are honoring marriage. That's, that's healthy. That's helpful. I appreciate that. Beyond that, keep reading. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So, thank you for reminding us of the need for humble contentment. And it can come if we trust in the Lord. I may not have everything I think I need, let alone what I think I want. But the Lord's my helper. He's giving me what I need. And with that, that's enough. How about the counsel in verse 7? Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, that's where they're aiming you. I'll admit, sometimes church leaders can seem not as sensitive as we might want. Sometimes our bishop or our stake president or our relief study president or our ministering brother... Sometimes they seem to fall short. And yet, if we'll remember those who have been called to lead us spiritually and realize that they're doing the best they can, maybe I need to do a better job of considering the end of their conversation rather than the means of their conversation. That would make a huge difference. Instead of, what did you just say to me? Or how are you treating me? Or why aren't you doing this differently? Think, okay, that's just the means. What was the end? What are they aiming for? They're, they may be struggling to hit the mark, but are they aiming 
at my exaltation? Actually, yes. Can I cut them some slack and be more patient with them as a result? Don't forget, the rod of Aaron is in the Ark of the Covenant too, underneath the mercy seat. Christ came to cover for those things too. Anytime I see somebody doing something not quite the way I thought they should, if I can give them the benefit of the doubt and consider the end of what they're hoping for, hmm, that gives me more patience with them. Hopefully they're doing the same with me. <laughs> okay. Or verse 9, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. This sounds a lot like what he said back in Ephesians chapter 4, right? Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Yeah, don't get, don't get blown about by these strange things. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. So now we're back to the law and those Aaronic priests. And yes, they may have eaten that which was sacrificed at the tabernacle, but hey, the Lord is offering a far greater sacrifice on a far more heavenly altar. So being so worried about, well, was this prepared in kosher ways or is that against the law of Moses? Can we get past those meats and start talking about the grace of God? In some ways, we saw this in Romans and in Corinthians when they're judging each other for going to the Babylonian barbecue. And are you participating in idolatry? Or, no, I'm just trying to fit in for their sake with the, the Roman population. Trying to be in the world without being of it so I can make a difference there. But are we judging each other? Are we despising each other? Right? Pride from above, pride from below. Forget it all. Can we get past the whole meat thing, please? And start talking about grace and treating each other graciously. Or verse 11, For the bodies of those beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Let's go back to one of those earthly shadows, those foreshadowings, a pattern for heavenly things. But the earthly version, yeah. Sanctuary, high priest, animals burned outside the camp. Now let's see how they reflect the heavenly form. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, not the animals, suffered without the gate outside the city of Jerusalem, just like the animals were burned outside the camp of Israel. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now, that seeking one to come takes us back to Hebrews 11, right? that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, that I don't live here. This is temporary shelter. My city is the city of the living God. I'm helping to build it. In this case, yeah, we don't have a continuing city, but it's, it's on its way. In the meantime, what should we do? Well, can we be more gracious? Can we be more loving? Can we entertain strangers and let them in? In this case, can we go outside the gate? Because sometimes we do live these cloistered lives. And, oh, I can't, I can't go out of doors. Those sinners outside. No, let's stay here within our little monastery and be safe from outside influence. There's something about the courage Paul is suggesting here. of going. Jesus went outside the gate. That's how he brought salvation to all of us. Think about breaking down the middle wall of partition, right? And allowing the strangers to come in. Fellow citizens with the saints, the household of God. So go out and do that. While you're at it, verse 15, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate... And their communicate isn't just like verbal communication. We're talking sharing here, okay? Giving what you have to others. To communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. That's a pretty interesting simplification of the law of sacrifice. Make it a blessing to other people. Rather than trying to give God what he doesn't need, give to your neighbor what they do. Give them something that will help them. 
Then, verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. We talked a little bit about that earlier, of cut them some slack, consider the end of their conversation. They are going to have to give an account to God after all, but leave it between them and God. And in the meantime, follow their counsel. Obey those who have been given responsibility over your soul, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. To make it a little more personal, he asks, pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience. I'm doing everything I can. I, I know I'm imperfect, but my, my heart's in the right place. My conscience is clear. In all things willing to live honestly, but I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. In a way, please be the best kinds of saints you can be. Leaders doing the best they can, but followers hopefully doing the same. Paul, I'm, I'm doing the best I can just like our prophets, seers, and revelators are doing today. There was something Elder Maxwell once said years ago that really struck me. It was at the end of a, a talk, and he said, he bore his testimony, and then he said, I know I will be held accountable to God for the testimony I have just borne. So he took his role incredibly seriously. But then he added, and this is the part that jolted me, but having given that testimony, you are now accountable for what you have heard. Ooh. Paul is in my court. How will I honor the testimony of those who have been called to lead me home? Paul, thank you for example, your example. You're well worth following. Then verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You get a sense here that Paul is starting to wrap up the sermon. It almost concludes with a closing prayer, and here he's offering it to God, this God of peace. You who have such power to bring life out of the jaws of death, you raised your son. Will you raise the rest of us? He's the good shepherd. We are the sheep of thy fold. So through that blood, through his everlasting covenant that I've been talking about for the last 13 chapters, what is Paul's prayer? May that God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now that's his first attempt to end the sermon. Can't quite walk away yet because he loves the people too much. But for here, oh my friends, if God can raise Jesus, he can raise you and me. If we can keep working at it, he'll keep working on us. Our works aren't saving us, but they are hopefully reconciling our will to his so we can accept the salvation he so freely is offering us. Put the dukes down. Overcome your fear with faith and come boldly to his throne of grace. Please. And then parting words. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer or bear with the word of exhortation. I mean, by now I've been giving you 13 chapters worth. <laughs> okay, and yeah, maybe you've suffered a bit because this has been a long sermon. But please bear with it. Just be okay when people point out room for improvement. They're doing it because they love you. So please bear with that. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. Really? It's been quite a bit. Well, okay, sorry, Paul. Yes, just a few words. I, I actually wish we had more. And then he does sign off. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. In the meantime, salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. And there's our final farewell. Oh, the way we read it in Scripture, with Hebrews being the last of these letters. There's his farewell to all of us, too. And I'll miss him. Next week, we are in, are, we're with James. And he's amazing. And then we're with Peter for a week. And then we're with John for a week. And then we're in the book of Revelation for three. And our New Testament study will come to a close. 
But having spent months and months with Paul, can we salute him in return? Can we thank him for the grace of God that he's praying will come to us? I love this, this intrepid soldier for, for the cross of Christ. I'm amazed by his faith and fortitude. I mean, I'm amazed by his doctrine, his theology, his genius. It's confusing at times. James is going to be a much more straightforward than Paul ever was. Peter too, okay? John, yeah, yeah, there's going to be some symbolism there, okay? Brace yourself for revelation. But as we say goodbye now to Paul, I just want to express, express my gratitude to him. I'm thankful for so many one-liners that we have studied in letter after letter after letter. We'll conclude this one with some of my favorite one-liners from chapter 11, 12, and 13. And I'm sure there's so many more that I missed. If there's any that you want to talk about, please share your thoughts in the comments. But just by way of review, as we come to the close. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He being dead, yet speaketh. Without faith it is impossible to please him. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. She judged him faithful who had promised. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Out of weakness were made strong, of whom the world was not worthy. They without us should not be made perfect. Compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. The removing of those things that are shaken, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Our God is a consuming fire. Entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. That great shepherd of the sheep, working in you, that which is well-pleasing in his sight. I, for one, am eternally grateful for that work in me. In my case, I know he's got his work cut out for him, but I'm grateful for his patience. And I suppose the least I can do is to continue to run my race with equal patience, waiting for the promises to come that I know someday will. I'm so grateful for what Paul has given us in these Magnificent chapters of Hebrews. I testify of their truth. I hope that we have all been convinced of what Paul is trying to teach us. Namely, 
the incomparable Christ, a superlative Savior. Go back and look for every time the word better appears, and higher, and greater, and holier, and that's the Jesus that we worship. His is a better testament, built on better promises. He is a better sacrifice and a better high priest. He is higher than the heavens and yet willing to come down to our lowly level. And I thank him for that. I am grateful that he will pick me up and help me run my race. I am grateful that he has parted the veil to make it possible for us to pass through it. Come boldly. Come into the holiest place you've ever been and recognize him who sits upon that throne as the loving Lord that has always been there beckoning us to come forward. I testify he lives. And I bear you Paul's testimony alongside mine. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.